Today we take a look at The Six Million Dollar Man, Wine, Women, and War from 1973. So this was the second telefilm that, uh, it's, it's the second of three that comprised the first season of The Six Million Dollar Man. And I do not remember these films at all. I'm not sure if I ever saw them as episodes as a kid or not, but I have no recollection of it. And they don't contain the tropes that I I came to associate with the series, for instance, the sound effects when Steve Austin would move his arm or the slow motion running, those types of things. So these are very different films than mm -hmm. what I remember from the series. And we talked about the first one. I liked the first one mm -hmm. uh, regardless of the fact that it didn't have those things that I remembered. This film I thought I was going to love because it was produced by Glenn Larson. And Glenn Larson does Buck Rogers, Battlestar Galactica, Magnum P.I. He did Cover Up with Johnny Eric Hexum at, at the beginning. Uh, he did Knight Rider, which is one of my favorite shows, but still it's, it's a highly um, nostalgic and, and a cult classic for, for a lot of people. So I thought this one was going to be even better than the first one, which I thought was a little slower paced, but again, that's more uh, in keeping with the time period. What did you think about it? I didn't like this one. Um, I don't know if I should say as much as the first one or just leave it at that. I think that this one was very different, but not in a good way. And the edits from when he would like be fishing to when he was trying to capture something and then it was completely fine. It was weird and I didn't there like There were a it. lot of strange edits in this piece. They did a lot of stock B-roll pulled from other sources and the, it was very choppy and it made no sense. In, in the scene you're referring to, uh, Steve has been captured by the Russians. David McCallum plays a Russian agent and uh, Britt Eklund is, is another uh, agent and she's on the boat with him and he can stay out on the boat because he was friends with David McCallum or they respect each other. And so when he was captured, instead of killing him, they put him out on this boat and he's supposed to stay out there and stay out of trouble. Mm -hmm. So they let him fish. So he's sitting there and he's sitting in one direction and he doesn't have a, you know, a, a, a fishing reel in his hand or anything else. And then you see all this stock footage of hands with one of those mm -hmm. big, you know, sport fisherman kind of fishing reels and, and a swordfish or a, a marlin that, that's being tried, uh, reeled in and everything. Mm -hmm. And when they cut back to Steve Austin, he's sitting in the wrong direction and there's no rod or reel anywhere near him. Mm -hmm. And there's no evidence that he was fishing, but he was supposed to have been fishing. And that's just an example of it. There's tons mm -hmm. of those types of edits in here. And it's very sloppy and very confusing and very patchwork. So very hard to follow in some ways. I mean, I could follow the story. I couldn't. <laughs> I kind yeah. of could. <laughs> I mean, I can understand why you couldn't. Now, the other thing about this film is this one plays much more like a James Bond film. They sort of ignore a lot of, I mean, they use his bionics, but very limitedly. Mm -hmm. And they sort of treat him like a James Bond figure. Uh, it starts out the opening gambit, if you want to call it that. Uh, it starts out with him in, in, in an international scene, and he's supposed to get on a, on a boat, on a luxury liner, and, or a, a private yacht. And it's owned by Eric Braden's character, who's in this film. He was also in one of the Herbie films, Herbie Goes to Monte Carlo, that we watched. He's supposed to infiltrate that uh, yacht, go into the safe, and steal this these the documents that they need. And there's some love interest that, that he has right at the very beginning. She comes out on the balcony when he's looking out and con contacting the submarine. And... She leaves, and then later Steve goes to the ship, and ultimately the, the whole thing falls apart, but he finds out that she was killed, and it destroys him for the rest of the movie. He's mm -hmm. just distraught by this, but we never had any... Explanation. Well, we just never saw them together except right. for that brief second, and in that brief little encounter, he didn't really look like he cared about her that much, mm -hmm. but all of a sudden he was completely upset by this. Uh, so it was, a, it was very... I don't know. It it took a lot of shortcuts and the mm -hmm. edits were very confusing. And I was very disappointed in it from the standpoint of, like I said, Glenn Larson does a lot 
of, mm -hmm. of what I love. A lot of my childhood favorites are there, but this one just didn't necessarily work. Yeah, I think at the beginning of this one for me, I was kind of excited, especially when he would like use his eye or something. Yeah, they did like, use the eye in this one where they did not in the first one. But it was only once, right. I think. And I was excited for that. I was wondering if he could go into the um, water because of his right. bionic bionics. Yes. Um, and that happened, and I was excited for most of the beginning, like the very, very beginning, and then kind of towards the middle-ish, I kind of just was like given up. Yeah, I mean, again, they tried to go with this James Bond-esque kind of thing. So Eric Braden is playing a James Bond-style villain here. It's it's a world domination kind of scheme that he's working with. And it's very, I don't know, a little bit over the top. Interesting that he played all these villainous characters, kind of, because he's, you know, he's sort of a rugged, rugged good-looking leading man type, but he played a lot of villains in these films. And, and that James Bond formula, I mean, certainly Lee Majors could pull it off, but I... I Ultimately, that's not what Steve Austin mm -hmm. winds up doing and being successful with in the series. So I think this, you know, these were a little bit strange. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, I think they were still trying to feel their way around and find how they were going to use the character. And I don't think this one was that successful in that way. Yeah. Um, in the first one, his arm did get, like, broken in a way. Yeah, his, and, his skin gets ripped open and you can see the mechanics and the bionics right. inside. But in this one, the same thing happens, and I thought that there would be, like, a different problem or something, and it was just the same problem over and over. Right, and that's another thing, uh, a good point to bring up, is the footage, they used footage from the first film uh -huh. and tried to pass it off as new footage. So when he did damage himself, after that opening uh, piece, he goes back and he has more surgery. And the Rudy Wells character passes from Martin Balsam to Alan Oppenheimer in this film. And we do get Richard Anderson as Oscar Goldman. This is the first time we see him, and he would become a series regular. So they, he's having this operation, but it's the same footage that was used in the first I film wonder. for the original operation. It's exactly the same. I mean, it's all the same. But we're expected to believe that it's a new operation, and it, it, this is mm -hmm. new. This is a new experience that's happening. It's not like a flashback. It's it's a new operation. Mm -hmm. So it, again. They used a lot of that. There were other scenes where the edits, you know, there was, I don't know if it was supposed to be computer banks lining up, but the scale was all confused. So it looked like, mm -hmm. is it two levels of a, of a building? And, right. and these are open, or is it a small, is it a smaller scale and we're seeing computer banks lighting up? I couldn't even tell what it was I, at I times. Know. And you asked me, you said, what is that? And I'm like, I honestly don't know. I didn't know what right. it was. I couldn't tell you. And it was that same sequence appears we have watched the third movie, and we'll come back and review that. Mm -hmm. um, that one is uh, the, the the Solid Gold Kidnapping, I think it's mm -hmm. called. Uh, and that's also a Glenn Larson produced one. And they use that particular footage in that one, too, with these things lighting up, these banks lighting up. And I, again, I could not tell. Is this a, what, what is the scale? Is this a building with two levels and we're seeing it? Or is it a smaller scale computer? I couldn't tell. So very sloppy edits, lots of stock B-roll. It seemed like the script was kind of patchworked together and they really didn't have the formula yet for this, mm -hmm. for this particular uh, yeah. um, character, frankly. They just didn't know I what feel, to do with him yet. I feel like it was like lazy writing. Well, I, you know, I, I think it, it was adapted, I, I mean, it was adapted again from another Martin Caden novel, but I think they adapted it piecework, and then yeah. they tried, I think they got everything in, and when in the edit room they realized we need more here and we need more there, so they tried to use some stock footage mm -hmm. that just didn't necessarily play. Uh, again, Glenn Larson is one of these uh, producers who, use, who sort of has a stable of actors that he will use in all his series. So Britt Eklund is one of those. We see her here. We will see her again in Battlestar Galactica in, in a guest role, and we see her in some other ones. Um, in, the, in the third film, we'll see Terry Carter, who has a, a prominent role in Battlestar Galactica as well as Colonel Ty. Uh, Glenn Larson does that a lot. So you will see actors that he really likes, he will use over and over again. And I think, you know, maybe he was just feeling his way through this a little bit. Um, but, you know, I do think, you know, there were some elements in here that would sort of make their way into the television show. But for the most part, this was a bit of a mess. Mm-hmm. All right, anything else? No, I don't think so. All right, last take. 
I'm gonna give this one a skip it. Yeah, for me this one's a skip it too. Uh, the first one I, I could get by with even the slow pacing and everything because mm -hmm. I thought the story was well told. This one was just, it was too patchwork. It was too confusing and the edits were really, really yeah. confusing. So, and, and again, the formula, they were trying to duplicate James Bond here and it didn't come, I don't think it was a successful uh, mm -hmm. copy of that. So, well, we'll be back with the solid gold kidnapping next time.